Sure. Uh, you know, uh, this is a really important subject. You know, it's about uh, healing processes, and that's something that Indigenous people understood for a long time. And uh, we're in the midst of a great change right now, and it's called the Eighth Fire. Uh, a lot of people are aware of it, uh, but not really understanding the full impact or the meaning behind what the Eighth Fire really is. But it's a time that was predicted uh, about 1,200 years ago that we would go through these times where the indigenous people would begin to merge with the Western people, these new people that arrived on our land. And they said during this time, they would call it the mingling, and uh, these two cultures would collide. And uh, eventually, indigenous people would rise up above and begin to talk about their culture and identity. Because right now, we've had 500 years of oppression, and so that's a lot to take. There's a lot of our community members uh, don't know how to handle it. And, you know, we have all kinds of legacies that are a part of this uh, collision, which is residential schools, foster care. The education system itself is a tool that uh, marginalizes Indigenous people and their thoughts and their experiences and their, their skills. So we have a ways to go yet, and uh, I've made it my... Uh, role in life that uh, I was going to change things. So as an artist, I go into the education system. I change the way people see indigenous people. I talk about the truth of our histories and our nature. And I break down stereotypes that uh, still impact all of us indigenous people walking on this, uh, walking on our own homeland. So, uh, you know, I, I did feel, I think, uh, a lot of that shame he was talking about. It took me a long time to, uh, you know, feel comfortable in my own skin, I guess. You know, uh, my mother, uh, um, you know, she sat me down when I was six years old and she told me that, you know, she changed my last name because she felt it would be easier in life for me to, you know, not identify as an indigenous person. And I think, you know, even my grandmother used to say, you know, I'm going to have to work 10 times as harder to get half as much. And I think, you know, the matriarchs of my family telling me, um, you know, it's going to be hard and I should essentially, you know, hide who I am. You know, that, that does a lot. I think uh, to, to, to a kid, but I think, you know, so for, for me, to take, uh, you know, Ace and Abby, that's my family name. So that's my artist name, but it's also, you know, it's a big part of my journey to kind of reclaim that, you know, f the times that they were growing up were much different than the times that I'm growing up. That I can sit here and say, I'm OG Cree, I'm Ace and Abby, and I'm proud of that. that that's a huge, uh, you know, a huge step forward from from the times that they grew up so growing. This is a big conversation. We don't have time for that today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's a, uh, it's a, you know, we're we're talking about a lifetime of experience. Uh, you know, of uh, racism. Uh, from my earliest days, I remember what it was that I was different and that I was always being made fun of or poked at or mimicked or 
it was always this kind of uh, negative stereotype that was always being put on me. Uh, so it was very tough when I was young and I didn't know how to handle it and uh, all I could do was just put up with it. I, I didn't have a recourse. But I did get in a lot of fights in school and that was okay because, you know, sometimes that's what you had to do to defend yourself, to say that uh, you, you belong here. And, uh, you know, I think the best thing that I ever learned was uh, the history of our people. When I started realizing the real history, then I had a way to compare and I could tell where all the misrepresentations were in conversations and at school. Even in university and high school, I had to deal with that stuff because there's different levels of this uh, systemic racism that's built within our, our whole society here. And it's not our society. We're in a settler society. So let's get that straight because that's really important to realize. And um, so I began to um, do a lot of research on our history, where we come from, and break down a lot of this uh, misrepresentations and misunderstanding about who Indigenous people are. Because a lot of things that you will hear about Indigenous people hasn't been spoken of by Indigenous people. It's usually by settlers talking about Indigenous people, you know. So I'm, I'm really uh, into this idea where Indigenous people, in order to, you know, to, to reclaim yourself and your identity, is to know yourself. That's the best thing, you know, and it's for real. You know, if I want to explain all the details of this, we need three hours to, so I can talk about it all. Because there's just too much to say, even in this uh, short time that we have here. And it's all really important because identity is uh, the number one thing that Indigenous people need to learn in order to, uh, you know, have a good handle on their self-esteem. So self-esteem can be healed by the understanding of the true history of Indigenous people. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I'm a, a singer-songwriter and a storyteller, and I'm also a journalist as well, actually. Um, and so I think at the, uh, you know, I, I've always had a bit of troubles trying to reclaim my identity because I feel like there's always this little sense of imposter syndrome, I guess. And I think, you know, I, I even at the Indigenous Music Summit, when I was... Uh, you know, I got to be there with some some really amazing indigenous excellence and, and you know, even our strongest voices were saying that they, they, they had the same feeling that they, am I indigenous enough? Am I doing this in a good enough way? And these are people who are up there are like on the front lines and just really, you know, being our strongest voices. And to hear them say that kind of just, you know, made me feel a little, I don't know if sure I've comforted is the right word, but to know that even even people that you know I look up to are, are feeling the same way that, that I do is is was so huge for me, and I think um, you know to further uh, Philip's point, I, I think you know you can't really know who you are unless you know where you come from, and and I think you know at the beginning you know, of March fifteenth, I remember I. Uh, I had moved my grandfather into long-term care, and, and I had flown back, and, um, and, and as soon as my plane landed, the, the pandemic was, was declared in Canada, and, uh, you know, and, and I, you know, I work in, in news, and uh, it seemed like there was a story every other day, um, you know, about a different outbreak at a different long-term care home. Uh, across the country, and so I was just, 
you know, worried. So I was calling my grandfather, you know, at almost every day. And I was talking like, oh, how are you doing? Uh, and you know, those, those little pleasantries can only go so far. So then we started talking about things that we'd never talked about before, you know, um, his life on the trap line and in Sandy Lake and, uh, you know, his time in residential school and, you know, meeting my grandmother and, and his life after that. And I think, you know, we, 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 we grew up in, in the north and we didn't grow up in, around uh, our community. You know, my grandfather res went to residential school and he met my grandmother there and their parents didn't want them to get married. So he had the choice between going back to a family he didn't know or, or starting a new life with, with, with my grandmother. So we chose to do that and, you know, we didn't grow up in the community. He was kind of, you know, a bit ostracized. And, and those northern communities can be a bit, you know, it, it's, it's hard for, you know, there's this mentality, you know, called, it's toxic masculinity, I guess, where you're not supposed to share your feelings. You're supposed to be a tough guy, right? And so I, I think that was maybe one of the boundaries or, you know, or borders, I guess, that kind of, walls even that kind of kept us from talking about these really I'm not sure if serious is the right word but just family history to know where we came from and how we got to be where we are now and um, you know and and so we started having these more serious and deeper conversations that just made so much sense to 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 why my family was the way it was and, and, and how we got here. And, and I, I remember there was one story he was telling me about the trap line, which, which I did remember. It was one night he did, he did tell me, but then I realized uh, he was forgetting little details. And, and I think, you know, the journalist in me kind of kicked in, I guess, and I asked him, do you, you know, I asked my grandfather, I said, do you mind if I start recording these conversations just so, you know, the stories are preserved somewhere because, you know, he's my last direct connection to, to, to my family history and, and where we come from. And he said, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, we spent the first uh, half of the pandemic isolated and, you know, he was uh, in his care home and I was in my apartment and we just have these conversations. And, um, I think about six months into that, um, I was listening back to, to some of the recordings and he was telling me about his father, C.C. Bano, and I remember asking him, you know, what, what does C.C. Bano mean? And he didn't know, he didn't know uh, what his father's name meant, and, and that just really struck me. And it wasn't because he had forgotten, or it was just, you know, he was taken when he was a kid. And, you know, there's so much of you know the indigenous family core that that was destroyed by the the residential school system you know you know you know understanding love and and how to be a parent and all all those things but just not knowing your own father's name really really struck me and uh and i just i i think i was just you know i've music has always been a way for me to kind of process things um, and so I, I was listening to that, and I was also playing guitar at the at the time, and, and just kind of wrote a song, and 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 I guess it was it was that moment of like how this is how I can tell a little piece of our story, you know, like I think journalism and music have always been very parallel um, for me, but. Uh, this is the first time they're kind of intersecting, and it's kind of just to kind of, I'm not sure if immortalize is the right word, but to kind of just save something, a little piece of, you know, indigenous history, a little piece of my family's history, you know, like I think when it comes to identity, so many cultures don't have to worry about it because there's books and there's museums and there's all this stuff, but for a lot of indigenous people, it's just stories and they're, and they're just being forgotten daily, you know, so. Um, Can I add something to what he's saying? Please. You know, uh, this is a really important point, you know, about memory and about hanging on to stories from your own personal history. 
But one uh, really important thing to remember, and this is for all of uh, the young people out there that uh, are not involved in their own culture, is to participate in your culture and uh, find a way to find an elder to go to the ceremony, do the sweats, do the vision quest, do the sun dances, go to pipe ceremonies, do all of these things because this is activating your blood memory. So it's real, this idea of blood memory. I've experienced it many times, you know, I'm a sun dancer and a pipe carrier and I'm a sweat lodge leader, so I've been doing it, you know, running sweat lodges since 1985, a long time. So I've seen a lot of things and I'll tell you something, uh, that's the best place to go. If you're in doubt about your identity and you don't have any connections to the history of your family, start going because uh, the history can always be reactivated and it, it does come to life. You know, those memories are in your blood and it's very real. So, thank you for sharing your story. Well, I guess the key thing about those murals going across Toronto is about an Indigenous reflection. I grew up in Toronto and I saw no Indigenous reflection during my whole childhood there. And uh, it felt like I was in someone else's country. So I didn't recognize it as my own place. So uh, I guess the first time I had a chance to do some public art like that was for New Credit uh, First Nation. The Mississaugas, I did a creation story mural for them a thousand square feet 
And it was to tell the whole story of the creation story of the Anishinaabe. And I uh, realized this was really important. And, I, and so the main thing about that whole mural was that it was going to be a stepping stone for the language classes. So the language teacher could come in and talk about all these different points down through history. And I thought that was amazing. And uh, so that was the beginning of my uh, creating murals for public spaces. And so um, one of the other things that kind of spurred this on was getting connected with uh, a youth shelter. There was an indigenous youth shelter in Toronto called, um, um, what's that name again? Let me think. Um, I can't think of the name right now. But it was uh, run by Nishnabi, or sorry, uh, it was run by Nami Res. So they had a youth shelter there and, and I was invited to come and be the cultural teacher. So I accepted the job. And uh, I began to figure out what kind of programming was good for these young people. And I realized that uh, if I was going to teach them something about our culture, that it would have to be coming from our culture. And one of the main uh, sources of that was the art world. There was a lot of really important indigenous artists who were telling our stories all across, you know, the world. You know, Morisot was one of those artists. And uh, so I was inspired by that. And uh, so we created a, an 80-foot mural that uh, it's on display at Fort York at times, but it was about the creation story, but from a woodland style perspective. And, uh, and I realized this was a really great tool because I could teach the young people about their culture while they're learning to paint and uh, putting work out into public space because it was giving them a sense of pride that their handiwork was there being uh, appreciated by the public and it didn't matter if it was indigenous public or if it was settler public, it doesn't matter. It, it, the fact is that this was a kind of a, a way to repair uh, their self-esteem, a way to you know get a handle on uh, you know their their self-image as an indigenous person that they no longer had to hide uh, their indigeneity in public spaces, and it was important for me as an artist kind of like a breakthrough happened at that time. You know, I've been producing art for a long time since I was a kid and I've done all kinds of artwork, but the public space work uh, really was important to me because I realized that this was something that our whole community needed. It wasn't just myself. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, when they think about artists, they just think about these individuals making art and then they're coming out, they're not doing anything for the community. But from what I've seen, most artists in our community are doing things for our community. They're really trying to promote our culture, our identity, our stories, our way of life. And they're repairing a lot of the damage that colonialism has done over the last 500 years. And I think this is the number one um, thing for me was getting that story out there and saying this is our story and not being worried about uh, who was going to say anything because you know for a long time uh, growing up in this town I experienced a lot of racism and I was uh, I wasn't ashamed of myself but I was always ready for a fight because that's what happened when I was growing up and I realized now I don't have to be ready for a fight I just have to be ready to tell my story when people have questions about it.
Yeah, I, th I think that started out probably at a pretty young age. Um, um, yeah, I think, I, you know, I really turned to music uh, to kind of process things that I, when, I was, when I was really young. Um, you know, my, my mom ran away from home when she was, uh, I think, we 13 years old and, and uh, went to Winnipeg and you know, got mixed up with, with, with gangs there. And um, so she had, she had a lot of traumas from that. And I think when we grew up, uh, we, we moved, actually, uh, I grew up in Kamenistiqua outside of Thunder Bay. And um, we, we uh, yeah, yeah, we had this place. Um, it didn't have, like, electricity or running water or anything like that. So I had, like, three things. I, I had uh, I had this little dune buggy that we had made out of a lawnmower and uh, a bow and arrow that my grandfather gave me and this guitar that my brother left. And uh, so I drove this dune buggy around in a circle obsessively because it was really fun. And uh, then I built this jump for it, and then you know, I broke it. It like shattered into a like tiny jump. To... And so then I was like, all right, well, I got this bow and arrow, so I like played with that a bunch, and then um, you know, I ricocheted and flattened my mom's tire, so she took it away. <laughs> and then so you know, I had this guitar, and um, yeah, started started playing guitar, and uh, you know, I ended up just using that. I think music for me at that point kind of became a, a parent and a teacher and, and an advisor sometimes because I've, I've read these songs and sometimes I think at that point I was really uh, it's so hard for me to say this compartmentalizing for <laughs> I don't know why that's so hard for me to say um, and so I would just play these I just play and I just kind of like sometimes not even sing words they're just kind of like these just uh I'm um, just you know, yelling into the universe, just putting, putting an emotion out there. And then sometimes these songs would just kind of write themselves. And it was like, as, as, you know, so it's, it was always kind of healing in that sense. And in, in, in that I was just able to use music as, as a way to kind of, you know, process everything around me that, that I, you know, I was trying to make sense of, I guess. That sounds like a good one. <laughs> I used that one in my paper when I was doing my thesis, and I thought, wow, this is, uh, it's the time. We're in this time, and they call it the eighth fire, and uh, this is the time that these uh, storytellers, these artists, they're all going to rise up, and they're going to, you know, take our rightful place uh, up there with the rest of humanity side by side with all the leaders. And I think that's important that we're in this time of leaders. And uh, so a lot of us, you know, had to go through a lot of crap to get here. And the reason why we had to go through that crap was because we needed to be able to talk about it, bring it to the forefront and uh, help others to heal. Because everyone's trying to make their way to the top. All our community is struggling for a place there too. And so we always have to remember, you know, the reason why we had to make these sacrifices was because we were we promised before we were we arrived here that we would do the job that needed to be done so you know there was a lot of warriors that rose up and were born in the 50s and in the 60s and these these warriors rose up to 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 begin to talk about the injustices directed at our people for so long and it's those warriors that we have to remember we're connected with them. All of us here are returning warriors to stand up for our people. We're here to march forward and proudly uh, bring all our culture and our understanding and our language with us. 
So uh, blessings to everyone on their journey. Miigwech. Yeah, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, thank you for, for having me and thank you for sharing your stories. And I think, um, yeah, to further that point, it's, it's, yeah, it is about getting back in, in touch with community. And, you know, even Ishkade, uh, Ishkade, the, the label I'm with, was, was founded by Amanda Rayon and, and Shoshana Kish, very uh, prominent uh, uh, indigenous musicians and, and activists and you know, trailblazers and that. Uh, in the music industry, but yeah, Ishkade, um, that, that's meant to, to, to talk about the Eighth Fire as well, and that's kind of their mission statement with this whole label, so I bet that really resonates with me, for sure. And um, yeah, thank you all for, you know, your, for listening and, and your atten being attentive. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much.